Okay, we're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> so let people uh, kind of filter in here, and then we'll uh, get this shared out. Hope everybody's having a great Thursday. Welcome. My name is Kevin Cohen to our live Aquaria Coral Farm and Aquatic Life Facility. This is one of our uh, Q&A sessions on our live feed here. Um, looking forward to taking questions from, from all our Facebook followers and want to talk about reef keeping and some really unique and cool fish that we have in our facility here in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Okay, so we got some people filtering here, that's great. So here we're in my office. Um, behind me is my 120 gallon small polyp stony coral tank. To the right of me here is Ian Farb. How you doing? Ian's helping me out with the live stream here, along with some other team members. Um, Say hi, Chris. Hi. <laughs> this is Chris Mueller. So behind me here is a, actually a 120 gallon uh, small polyp stony coral dedicated reef aquarium. Um, this aquarium was set up back in 2007. Um, grow a variety of, of small polyp stony corals, primarily Acropora, um, and have some some functional fish in this aquarium, uh, things like rabbit fish that can, can help eat Bryopsis as a deep water chromus in this aquarium here, um, and, and also a copper banded butterfly fish that I like to use copper banded butterfly fish in reef aquariums that do not have uh, tube worms or, or things that they, they prefer to eat. Copper bands are actually very functional fish for uh, reef aquariums that don't have feather dusters and other you know, types of tube worms because they can help control aptasia anemone um, that, that oftentimes pop up and plague you know, home reef aquariums. So. Cool. So I think the first question we had was, you know, I've got a new tank, uh, I've got some brown, the you know, tank's starting to turn brown. Um, that's, that's normal in, in marine aquarium keeping. Uh, when, when you first establish a marine aquarium, it, it's not uncommon as the tank starts to cycle and you know, you, the bacteria are breaking down nutrients and so forth in the aquarium that you'll start to develop you know, a diatom bloom. And that's what that brown dusting powdery um, look over the glass and over the rock work is in, in your aquarium. So ideally you wanna check your ammonia, nitrite, nitrate levels and phosphate level. Um, you know, ensure that you've got adequate lighting on the on the aquarium itself, and just give it time so it, it gets fully established prior to uh, introducing you know animals into the reef aquarium. So, you know, over time that the diatoms will go away. Um, if it, if the aquarium's been set up for quite some time, however, it, it's normally due to the fact that you know perhaps you're maybe not doing enough water changes. You could have an elevated level of phosphate or nitrate in the tank. And that, that encourages and, and fuels diatom blooms in, in home marine aquariums. Yeah, and that question came from um, from our event page. From Noel. From Noel. Noel Shelton. So thank you for the thank you for the question, Noel. Um, we've got some other questions here. Um, let's see, Amanda Bartholomew, uh, how can I remove two damsels from my tank without removing corals and rock, or is that is that my best chance? So that's often a challenge, especially in larger reef aquariums. Um, the, the first thing I would try to do is to try to, you know, after the lighting goes off in the aquarium, you know, make sure you're really monitoring where those fish like to go, you know, to go rest at night. Um, so after the lights go off, you know, after you observe that for a few days, you know, that way you can go in again a couple days after when the lighting is off and try to strategically extract those, those fish out of the aquarium. There's, there's other means as well. Um, I like to use fish traps. Um, we, we sell a really nice fish trap um, that's glass with a, with a sliding door. And we've got a, a little bait stick in it that you can you know bait with uh, things like mysid shrimp or brine shrimp um, for your damsels there. And what I would suggest is whenever I'm trying to trap fish you know out of say this reef aquarium behind me or, or any and in any large aquarium is to set the trap into the aquarium, use the bait stick, feed the fish, you know, for three or four days. And just ensure that the fish are very comfortable going in and out of that trap before you actually try to trap the fish. Um, I, I've been impatient at times where I would try to, you know, put the trap in the aquarium, bait it and go, oh boy, you just went in there and try to let the door swing down. 
that normally doesn't happen. Fish are actually much, much smarter than, than a lot of people realize. And the fact that oftentimes it's almost impossible for that fish to go back in the trap because it basically knows what you're trying to do. So again, the first solution would be to observe your fish at night after the lights go off to where they're actually you know, picking a, a certain spot to rest or hide. And that way you can go, af go after them a few days later with a net. And if that fails, I would suggest trying to look into a trap. Great. That was a, from Amanda Bartholomew, so thank you, Amanda, for the question. Uh, next question comes from Emmanuel Becerra. When you get fish from your suppliers, how do you verify that they are being responsibly harvested and that the collectors get paid a fair value? That is a fantastic question. So, Live Aquaria, you know, we're committed to offering sustainably raised aquatic life that is either aquacultured or responsibly harvested. And how we do that is we partner with strategic vendor partners that have very short supply chains. So th that's, if we can't find fish that are being aquacultured or being farmed, you know, we choose to source fish from, from short supply chain regions such as Fiji or the Maldives, um, Sri Lanka, you know, areas where there's really not long chains of custody and that's where it, it's hard to, to validate the supply chain. So when we focus on areas and focus our efforts on importers and vendors that have short supply chains and their own collection stations, that's how we can help um, ensure that the fish that we're offering are responsibly harvested without you know, environmental impact. Awesome. Thank you, Emmanuel, for the question. Uh, next question comes from Karen Tigner. What is your take on GFO and carbon reactors? That's a great question. Um, I actually use a GFO and carbon reactor on this aquarium right behind me. Um, th this is a 180 gallon tank. What you see in the frame here is actually just a, a two by two by two section of this 180 gallon tank. Um, 180s are, are actually six feet long. Get you guys a good shot of it in a second. So Ian's gonna stand back there a little bit. So this is a conventional 180 gallon marine land aquarium. However, it's got two permanent built-in dividers. Um, and the reason that I have the aquarium set up this way is so that I can create different habitats and, and keep different fish together and, and segregate it properly. On this aquarium, I actually do have uh, a GFO and GAC reactor. So um, this is very, very common on reef aquariums to utilize uh, this methodology. And it works great because these reactors, I can change them, you know, very, very easily. Um, you know, I always put a date on the top of them when I'm changing the, the granulated activated carbon, which is in here, which is called GAC. And granulated activated carbon actually removes organics out of the water and just helps to really purify the water um, in reef or freshwater aquariums. This reactor here uh, has GFO, which is granular ferric oxide. And what GFO does is it helps uh, absorb phosphate out of the water. And anybody that keeps reef aquariums has fish and you feed some food into the tank, you know, you're going to develop elevated phosphates over time. So uh, granulated ferric oxide, GFO, is, is a great way to help um, reduce phosphate buildup and accumulation in reef aquariums. So these reactors are really, really easy to use. They're very easy to set up. Basically, you just really need a, a very small flow pump, and you're pumping water actually out of your sump, um, and the water flows in a reverse direction and kind of suspends that media inside those reactors. And I just piggyback the two reactors together, so the water's flowing through the granulated activated carbon first, and then it flows into the, the granular ferric oxide reactor after that, and then the effluent is actually just, just pumped back into the sump of the aquarium and it all flows back to the to the main display. Great. So we have another question um, from also from Emmanuel. How many fish do you have in your facilities and how do you prevent disease uh, at bay on Divers Den fish? I find it amazing how you guys can keep it that many fish alive. It is amazing. So we have multiple fish systems. Um, the, our facility right now is about 30,000 gallons. And when we bring fish in, um, they're, they're placed or acclimated into a dedicated quarantine system. And I can show you some of this equipment here in a little bit. We'll actually walk out to the coral farm and I'll, I'll explain our life support system and, and show you um, the methodologies that we employ in our facility here.
from a filtration and, and disease prevention standpoint. But basically for marine fish, we have three independent systems. So all of the new fish arrive, they're, they're quarantined and conditioned in a, in a 4,000 gallon acclimation system. Um, once they're quarantined and conditioned there, they actually get moved over into a different system where we, we run copper sulfate um, as a medication so that we can ensure that we're not you know, uh, passing uh, parasites like amblyodinium or cryptocarrion to the other fish. Um, and then the infiltration system we employ, uh, we, we utilize ozone and we util utilize um, amalgam glass quartz sleeved UV sterilizers. Um, and that works really, really well to help prevent um, the, the, the spread and transmission of, of diseases um, in our facility here. So you know, we have a great team of, of really dedicated and passionate um, people that I get to work with. Who you will meet. Who you will meet, for sure. Some of them. Uh, um, you know, we've got some great protocols in place. We, we, we established our, our facility here in 2005, um, and I, I've personally been in the fish industry for well over 30 years, um, working in a retail environment, to import-export environment, um, and then on, on here to, to Live Aquaria here in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. So, again, great team of people, really great life support systems in place, and also a, a great disease prevention protocol that we employ here in our facility. Awesome. Thank you again for the question. Uh, we have one from Chad. Kevin, when are you selling that pair of Kalani? <laughs> I hope I said that right. Is that right? <laughs> it's Kalani. Kalani. So, okay. um, th there's a fish behind me here, a pair of fish uh, in, in this 180 gallon split tank. Um, they're called Central Pygi Kalani. And, and this, these fish um, are a deep water fish. They're really not prevalent uh, too terribly. You know, they're, they're not available often in the marine aquarium trade. And when they are, um, you know, it's, it's infrequent. So this, this pair actually um, came out of New Caledonia in the South Pacific. Um, I've had these guys in here for probably about eight months now. They're, they're obviously doing very, very well. Um, these fish are actually going to get donated to the Rising Tide program. Um, we're really proud to work with and support um, the aquaculture initiatives. You know, Rising Tide Conservation is a, is a fantastic group. Um, it's a nonprofit group that actually can help fund and support aquaculture initiatives here in the United States. Um, so I've, I've committed to, to getting these Collins Angels um, into aquaculture, as well as I have a couple pairs of, of Centropygi Venusta, which are called purple mast angelfish. Those as well are, are a deeper water fish, not as prevalent in the marine aquarium trade. So it's, a, in my opinion, a great fish to get into aquaculture um, and get in the hands of, of some of these great, great you know, industry leaders that are that are breaking new ground and new barriers in the field of marine ornamental aquaculture. Awesome. Um, just wanted to chime in real quick for folks that are just tuning into the live stream. Um, we're taking your questions, so if you got any questions for Live Aquaria, uh, Director Kevin Cohn here, um, anything really about anything, we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, we're going to take your questions for about 20, 30 minutes, maybe a little longer, depending on how many questions we get, and then we're going to try to also get you guys out into our facility where we got some really cool new fish to show you. So thank you again for all the questions. Um, I'll get one up to another one here. Um, Dwayne Johnson says, I have a 20 gallon reef tank and wanted to give something new a try. Purchased an ultra flower a couple weeks ago and it's dead. Uh, everything else in the tank is doing very well. I have crab, snails, and shrimp. Could, And my cleanup crew, could any of these be the killer? Thanks. So ultra flower, I, I would presume that's a, a rock flower anemone. Um, Oftentimes they come in, in a variety of colors, but oftentimes they're really, you know, really colorful, like bright red or an orange. Um, those animals can, can oftentimes be damaged um, during transit or being be damaged before they're even shipped. Um, you know, all anemones have a have a pedal disc and a and a foot basically, and that foot attaches to a to a hard surface. And the reason they call those rock anemones is because they're attached to you know hard substrate or rock. So when those, those anemones are actually removed and then you know, being transported, it's not uncommon that, that maybe their foot could get damaged or get ripped. Um, and then that oftentimes leads to stress during, you know, stress, and then it's stressful to, to transport that animal, introduce them into a new display. Sometimes they just really won't recover from that. So assuming the fact that that wasn't the case and the, and the anemone came and arrived to you in, in a very healthy, you know, healthy condition, um, oftentimes it's, it's hard to adapt these animals to you know the specific lighting that's on on certain reef tanks or you, you may have a, an aggressive crab that you know 
took a liking to this anemone when you when you tried to introduce it into the tank. So great, um, Christopher Crines. I hope I'm not butchering your name. <laughs> Are there readily available species of fish that Live Aquaria has decided not to make available due to difficult husbandry? There is. You know, we, we really refine the assortment on Live Aquaria based on, you know, several different criteria. The, the first one is, are, are these fish tank busters? Do they get just way too large for conventional home aquariums? And that's really, really important. You know, we, we do also deal with, you know, academia and public aquariums. So that's where it, it's, it's, it's challenging at times. However, for, for end consumers, for hobbyists like myself and, and Ian and, and the rest of us, you know, oftentimes these fish just grow way, way too large for, for any home aquarium. So we choose not to even offer those in our assortment. And there's many species of obligate corallivores that we choose not to offer as well. And what I mean by obligate corallivores, these are certain types of fish that have very, very specific feeding requirements that perhaps they only feed on, say, pusillopora coral in the wild, um, or, or you know, specific sponges or tunicates. And a lot of, lot of nudibranchs are offered in the marine aquarium trade, and oftentimes these brightly colored nudibranchs that don't have, have shells um, have so specific a feeding requirements that even the scientific community doesn't really even know um, what to feed them. So animals like that aren't appropriate for home aquariums, and we choose you know, not to offer those. I will say, however, that there are some obligate coral corallivores that we've had really good luck transitioning over to prepared diets that last and, and, and do well and thrive for many, many years. You know, we Orange spotted filefish is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, it's the long-nosed filefish. We choose to procure these fish from, again, very short supply chains, primarily out of Fiji. Um, we've got a, a nice pair in the hands of, of actually many, many people that are trying to spawn and rear these fish and reproduce them. Matt Peterson was, was the first person that successfully spawned and reared orange spotted filefish uh, several years ago. And we're proud to, to work with these orange spotted filefish here in our facility from Fiji. Um, really work hard to condition these fish up um, and get them on a, on a prepared diet, get them strong, fat, and healthy so that they'll thrive in, in home aquariums. But the majority of obligate corallivores, no, we choose not to sell them, but there's very strategic uh, species of fish that, that that we feel are, we're comfortable bringing in here and offering, you know, to, to the consumer. Great. Uh, AJ asks, is there such a thing as a beginner Acropora? I have a few LPS and birds and that are doing well and was thinking of trying an Acro or two and seeing how it goes. So if, you, if you're growing birds nest coral, Serietopora, that's a great start. That means that you, you probably have a, a decent enough environment, um, whether it's lighting, flow, um, filtration, et cetera, that you can properly establish um, small polyp stony corals in your aquarium. You know, the most important thing to start with is to ensure that you maintain stable alkalinity, you have proper calcium level um, in the aquarium, uh, as well as make sure that the magnesium level is 1350 to 1450. Um, if that's the case, and you're gonna try an Acropora, I would highly suggest that you start with like a well-known strain that's been in the market for, for many, many years in aquaculture. Um, o ORA is a great company, Oceans, Reefs, and Aquariums in, in Fort Pierce, Florida. Um, ORA's got some kind of lineage corals that have been around for, for many, many years. They're like heirloom acropora corals. So there's, there's quite a few species of those types that I would, I would suggest starting with. Um, we grow corals here in our facility here in Rhinelander um, under the Live Aquaria brand. And we've got a lot of kind of heirloom corals as well that, that would make uh, a good addition for as a starter aquaphora. So I would, I would suggest staying away from stuff that, that has really smooth skin um, and, and very few corallites. Um, what you want to look for is more of a like a branching aquaphora that has a lot of a lot of corallites and polyps that come out. Those seem to be much hardier, much more adaptable than what we term as deep water aquaphoras, which are the, the smooth skinned acros. Cool. Uh, Raphael asks when the professional salt will be available. Actually, that's a great question. You know, we're we're super excited. Um, you know, we, we've been testing for for months and months and months um, uh, our, our our new salt here in our facility, and we're we're really proud to introduce the the Live Aquaria Professional Reef Salt. Um, this salt's going. It's it's available right now on DrsFosterSmith.com. 
for a pre-purchase, uh, pre-order. Uh, we, we offer it in three different sizes. Uh, we, we should have inventory here uh, September 28th. So we're really looking forward to, to being able to offer this to consumers. We're offering it in three different sizes. There's a 55 gallon mix bag. There's a 180 gallon mix. What's that? 53 gallon mix Sorry, 53 gallon mix bag. Yeah, and actually this right bag here. this bag you can try for free right now through drsfosterandsmith.com. It's a, it's a $24.99 uh, price point, but we're giving away a $25 gift certificate with purchase of the size. So you can you know try it for free, and if you're starting something new or thinking about trying something new, this is a, can be really good. So it, we offer this as a 53 gallon mix bag. We have a 180 gallon mix bucket, and then a, a 205 gallon mix box. So um, it's a great salt. And the reason I love this salt is that first off, it's made in very, very small batches. So it's made in about 2,000 pound batches so that the quality control and consistency of the salt is, is it's paramount for what we do in here in our aquaculture facility. But it's also very, very important for, for all reef hobbyists. So, you know, this, this kind of, you know, boutique blend or, or small batch um, uh, production is the way to go in my personal opinion, as well as the sourcing of the highest quality raw materials that actually go into the salt mix itself. Yeah. You know, we've struggled over the years to with, with utilizing salt, just like every every reef hobbyist and aquarist does. Um, you know, that consistency and quality is, is very, very important. And also, you know, I maintain these aquariums behind me that, that contain small polyp stony corals um, at, at an alkalinity level of about 90 kH. And oftentimes, other salts are mix up to a much, much higher alkalinity level. I'm a big proponent of changing water on aquariums, whether it's in here or, or in our show tank in the coral farm. So knowing that, we wanna really, you know, if you're doing big water changes, you wanna ensure that, that the alkalinity is very similar to what you maintain your aquarium at. So that's where this live aquarium professional reef salt comes into play for us. And last but not least, but the most important, is that the salt mixes up clean and clear. You know, we, we mix about 8,000 gallons of salt water a week. That's a lot of salt water to mix up. You know, we, we're constantly mixing up batches of water on a, on a daily basis. And w what oftentimes happens for us on, when you're mixing up this, this you know, quantity of water is that we're, we're having to tear down all our mixed tanks. We're having to, you know, use an acid bath to, to, to get, you know, impurities out of, the, out of the containers themselves. We're having to constantly clean the pumps and the equipment. So we really want to try to avoid that and, and really focus all of our efforts on, on just animal care here, so. And Sandra would actually like to know uh, what uh, your recommendations uh, in regards to the process of switching over to your, to your salt would be. That's a great question. So when, it, when anybody ever switches salt mixes, the last thing you want to do is do massive water changes in your aquarium. You know, it's important whether you're going from bad to good or good to bad that things happen you know, in a, in a very slow, slow manner so that these fish and corals can adapt to the to the new elements in the water, say when you're mixing up or, or starting to use or employ a new salt mix um, into your regimen for, for reef keeping. So, you know, just incrementally doing small, you know, maybe 10% water changes, you know, over the course of, of, of weeks or a couple months, that's definitely the way to transition onto um, a, a new brand of salt mix. Um, I really like this question from Jake. Uh, what are some of your favorite marine fish coming in right now? Maybe pick like five or three. What, what are? Because <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot. Yeah, what's, a, what's your favorite marine fish coming in right now? Boy, my favorite marine fish top coming three. in right now. Let's see. How about top, okay, top three? Top three. Um, I'm, I'm really proud to say that we, we just procured a batch of, of, uh, of macrophrygida, or sorry, Anapsis leonardi, which is uh, the leonard trass from Western Australia. I'll, sh I'll show everybody here in a little bit. Got a, got a bunch of juveniles in there, you know, maybe about two inches long. It's an incredibly beautiful fish that, that I haven't seen, you know, in, in quite some time. Uh, there's a big gap in, in the harvest of these fish from West Australia. Um, a, a few kind of trickled in earlier in the year, but um, this is a nice nice batch that, that, that has just come in, which is, which is great. You know, I'm a, I'm a big wrasse fan. I love wrasses. Um, the reason I do love wrasses is because they're colorful fish, they're very active fish, um, and they're great for reef aquariums. So, you know, the, the second awesome fish batch that, we, that we've got out there is, is Macrophrigate on Chodai, which is the, uh, the Chodes red leopard grass from Australia. So we've got a nice batch that we're conditioning up um, of these guys to, to, to get sold on the diver's den section here, you know, in the coming weeks. 
Boy, what else? Uh, the, the new Magma Ras is a, is a really awesome and cool Sierra Labris Ras. It kind of looks like a Flame Ras um, that, that's out of Hawaii, but this fish actually comes out of the Philippines, um, and it's a, just a bright, bright red fish. Um, I, I have a, an inkling that there's a few people that are working on identifying this fish down to species, which is great. Um, so I'm sure we'll hear more from, from some iconic people in the industry in regards to what species that will be. So, um, but again, the magma wrasse is a, a really bright, colorful. The fish is bright red, the whole fish. Um, and just a, a strikingly beautiful fish, active fish for reef aquarium. So right now, those are probably my three favorite fish that we've got in our facility here in the, in the wrasse category. So you can go over those real quick. There was the Leonard. It's the Leonard wrasse. The Chokes Red Leopard Chokes. Rass, and then the Magma Rass, That's which right. is okay. actually a fairy Rass, a Sierra Labor Right, Rass. okay. Uh, I just want to give a, well, I, I'd like to let you know that Reef Bright said, Kevin, thank you for all your contributions to our industry and our hobby. Keep up the great work. Thank you. And I would imagine that's Tulio, right? Thank I you, don't know. <laughs> thank you, Reef Bright. Yes. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Yes, you know, thank you. I, I appreciate everybody's support. Um, you know, obviously we, we do here on the coral farm, we're, we're all very passionate reef yeah. keepers. Um, there's some great industry leaders in, in this hobby and, you know, we, we're all learning every day and trying to disseminate information and help, you know, help other aquarists be successful. So, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Steven asks, I have a super healthy reef tank, coral's going great, I'm sorry, growing great, but I cannot control my green algae, any pointers besides water changes and turning the lights off. So there's many types of green algae. So depending on what type of algae it is would determine you know, how you can go about you know, trying to attack or, or correct or mitigate that problem. So you know, things like Bryopsis, which is this you know, kind of hair looking green type algae. It's really, really dense. It's, it's really hard to get off the rock work. Um, I would suggest if you do have a Bryopsis issue that you would start by manual removal. So you know, a thick bristle you know, nylon brush to scrape the algae off the rock and, and siphon it out as you're doing so is, is great means of control. Natural means of control, that's why actually these rabbit fish and fox face are in this, uh, my 120 gallon tank behind me, because I've had bryopsis issues in this tank and they're, they're really great herbivorous fish that, that, you know, target eating more hairy or more dense macro algae. So rabbit fish, fox face are great. Uh, there's certain types of urchins that work really, really well also, mm. sea urchins. Okay. Uh, things like pincushion urchins, um, there's what's called blue stripe tuxedo urchins. Um, th the biggest issue with these urchins is they like to stick stuff onto their back to camouflage them. Um, oftentimes that could be small pieces of coral, so if you've got a lot of coral frags in your tank that aren't well mounted, that might be problematic. However, if your, your corals are well mounted, uh, your tank's established, you know, these tuxedo urchins and pin cushion urchins uh, will target more macro algae in the tank. So there's other types of green algae that, that form as well. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a matting type algae that will cover your rock work. If that's the case, you know, I, I would definitely check your nitrate and phosphate levels in the tank, try to get those lowered down a little bit more so that coralline algae can, can outcompete, you know, the lower forms of algae to grow. You know, we all want coralline algae growing in our aquariums. That's that, that really nice purple looking algae that, that's a hard calcareous algae that grows over the rock work, that grows over your glass too and, and so forth. But what, once coralline algae is growing really well and it's, it's becoming prolific in the tank, it, it oftentimes uh, reduces the likelihood of, of nuisance algae to start growing. So, hope that answers your question. Awesome. Um, reef builders, um, what are some of the things you are doing or no longer doing to your reef tanks compared to five years ago? I really like that question. <laughs> Thanks, Reef Builders. I don't know if that's Jake. I think um, it is, yeah. If it is Jake. Because he asked the same question. How's it going? Twice, yeah. uh, Jake was here uh, several years ago, and we're, we're looking to actually, looking forward to having him back sometime. So what, what did I do five years ago that I don't do today? Boy, that's a lot. <laughs> I'm getting old, so I don't know if I can even remember back that far. But on a serious note, um, you know, I have, I have changed kind of my strategy on, on my, my reef aquariums in my office. You know, I employ calcium reactors, which I always have. Um, we utilize calcium reactors in the coral farm, and a calcium reactor is basically a chamber that's got coral rubble inside of it. Water flows through it at a very slow rate, um, and basically you dispense carbon dioxide into that chamber 
to slowly dissolve the coral media so that it provides stable alkalinity, magnesium, um, and calcium, and some other you know trace elements to the corals that grow. You know, with with kind of technology transfer, there, there's things called the balling method. There's there's other methodologies to you know manually dose your aquarium with liquid supplements like magnesium, calcium, um, and, and other types of, of elements as well. And on the this my 120 reef aquarium behind me, I actually ripped my calcium reactor off this tank and, and employed a kind of the balling methodology to to manually dose um, liquid supplements into this aquarium. So I really try to stay, you know, along with everything that we sell, we test in here in the coral farm. So it's important that I'm, I'm doing that as well. I have very good success using both the calcium reactor and kind of the balling methodology with a dispensing via dosing pump. So it's probably the biggest, biggest thing I've changed in the last five years. Great, thanks for the question again. Uh, Todd Zimmerman, what kind of lights are you running, metal halides or LED? Thank you for the question. Um, again, we like to test all the products that, that we offer here in the coral farm. I'm a, a huge proponent of LED lighting technologies. Uh, e Ecotech Marine makes a, a fantastic light. Um, the, the Radeon lights, the XR, XR30 Pro. Um, I actually have an XR15 on my Nano Cube, which is actually sits over in the corner there. Um, my, that. Yeah. So that's that's the Ecotech XR15. Um, I also utilize some. Yeah, so there we go. This is the XR15. Um, th this this LED light is I, I really enjoy because it's highly tunable. Um, yeah. I, I've got this hooked up to a reef link, along with a lot of lights in the coral farm um, out in our facility. And what's great about it is that you can actually tune and adjust this light for duration, spectrum, and intensity. Um, Ecotech's got some great preloaded programs that you can load into um, load into this lighting system here when it's hooked up to a reef link. Um, and then you can adjust all the different channels and, and so forth. And um, again, a highly tunable light which is great for, for all reef aquarists in that, whether you're growing you know, large polyp stony corals like this Goniopera coral here, or you're, you're, you're keeping mushroom corals and, and polyps and so forth. So um, it's great light for an Acropora tank as well, um, since it is so tunable and it's actually very, very powerful. I also use conventional lighting like metal halide lamps as well. This, this 120 gallon tank actually is illuminated still um, with lighting from five years ago. Um, basically 400 watt and 250 watt metal halide bulbs. They're mogul-based bulbs, which means they screw into a socket. Um, and these bulbs, these mogul-based bulbs, um, are, are radium and, and ushio bulbs in the, in the 15 to 20 K range. So, you know, there's, there's definitely applications for metal halide. There's definitely applications for, for LEDs as well. Um, I feel as technology keeps moving forward that LED lights are, are, are kind of the way to go um, for, for different different applications on different reef aquariums. Awesome. Um, Enrique asks, hey Kevin, so I really like fish but want to have a clean minimalistic aquascape but with less live rock. I need additional biomedia to keep nitrate down. What biomedia would you recommend? Thank you. So if you're trying to control nitrates in, in your aquarium, um, I'd suggest you look into carbon dosing. We employ that, that philosophy or that strategy here on, on the tanks behind me. And what carbon dosing is, is that you're actually adding types of, of different types of sugars for um, denitrifying bacteria to, to develop and break down nitrates in, in the reef aquarium. So uh, there's a company called Red Sea that makes a product called Nopox. It's, you know, uh, it's a wonderful product. Um, we, we sell it on drsfostersmith.com actually mix nopox and vinegar together um, and then we'll slowly dispense or drip this uh, this carbon dosing method um, which is a liquid method into the sump of, of, of my reef tanks here so what you need to do is you need to start and, do, and get your baseline of where where your nitrates and where your phosphates are at and then start slowly and incrementally adding um, you know a, a carbon dosing regimen to your tank um, that seems to be the easiest way for me to help control phosphate and nitrate along with water changes. Um, there, is, there is many different types of, of, of uh, resins and media that can also absorb phosphate and nitrate out of home reef aquariums as well. So I'd, I'd check out the media 
the media page on drsfostersmith.com under chemical media as well. Awesome. Uh, we have a question from Burton. Uh, I have a strange brown hair algae cyano question mark in a nine month old tank. Uh, cleanup crew taking care of some, but what else can I do? Yeah, so algae problems, we've all faced it, we've all been there. I, I struggle with it at times as well. Um, I don't know if it's a seasonal thing, if it's the amount of CO2 in the air or whatever. Um, when, you, when you run into this, this, this problem, um, the biggest thing is just aggressive manual extraction. So if you can really like take out the specific rock where that algae is growing, you know, take a nylon brush and really scrub that rock off, um, that, that helps to, to, to reduce it from spreading. Um, a, another thing to use is actually hydrogen peroxide. So a dilution of, of a 10%, a uh, you know, 10% conventional hydrogen peroxide that you would buy, you know, at a, at a drugstore, mix that with seawater, um, and then you can soak your, your piece of live rock that, that it's growing on in hydrogen peroxide, and it will actually um, break down the cell structure of algae so that it basically kills the algae. When you're finished, you know, give it maybe a 10 minute dip and then rinse that off in, in, in seawater and then you can put the rock back in your tank. You, know, you, you want to make sure that you don't dip small polyp stony corals or, or any corals in that, that elevated hydrogen peroxide solution, but that works well to help you know, when you've got algae on one specific rock. Other, other are natural, natural predators, things like rabbit fish and surgeon fish, um, urchins, um, even things like Sally Lightfoot crabs will help eat you know, larger pieces of macroalgae in a corner. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you for the question. Uh, Pat asks, hey Kevin, I had a problem with picking my 75 gallon reef tank, what is the best way to get rid of it? So the, the best way to get rid of it, if you've got Amblyodinium or Cryptocarian, Odinium is kind of a powdery look uh, when the fish is looking straight at you. It looks like somebody dumped baby powder down the fish. Uh, Cryptocarian is much more prevalent. Are much more common, and that's like large white dots of dick that you that you see on um, on fishes in reef aquariums. So it's challenging because the, the the best way to to get rid of that is to actually pull all the fish out and put them in a quarantine aquarium, um, and either um, medicate those those animals in a quarantine system away from your reef tank, um, or use the tank transfer method, which that's really common, uh, especially these days really good luck with the tanks transfer methodology in that you set up a couple a couple quarantine tanks basically put your fish in one tank for 24 hours switch it into the next tank for 24 hours as you bleach the previous tank um, rinse that really well and basically you keep transferring these fish back and forth um, between uh, between quarantine tanks um, you can use some basic filtration on these tanks you know things like cycled sponge filters or power filters and the life cycle of a, of a parasite like Amblyodinium or Cryptocarian is that you know, it's about um, 18 to, to 24 days. And what happens is that when you see the parasite on the side of a fish, an ick parasite, that parasite's at the end of its life cycle. And that parasite's gonna fall off the fish naturally when most people think, wow, my fish just healed up out of the blue. That's great, he's healed. But what's happening is that parasite lays in substrate or you know the bottom of the aquarium lays dormant. It will again hatch out um, you know, all the larvae will swim, swim around and then, then basically attack your fish again um, and, and then you'll see the fish has egg again. So again, I wouldn't recommend any form of medication in an established reef aquarium. The best, te the best technique is to pull those fish out of the tank and either medicate them in a quarantine aquarium, a separate quarantine aquarium, or imp implement a tank transfer method. Great. Uh, let's see. Matthew asks, uh, you guys Hi guys, do you ever see zebra or barbaganti Bar 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 seahorses available in the States? No, we don't. Um, the barbaganti seahorse is the, is the tiny, tiny little pygmy seahorse that, that is, you may, maybe you've seen it in a documentary. Um, they actually are, are established themselves on a specific type of sea fan or gorgonia. But these little barbaganti seahorses, we, we don't see in the aquarium trade. I, I do know that that the good folks at the California Academy of Sciences, uh, Richard Ross and Matt Wendell, um, they, uh, several years ago, actually uh, harvested some of these animals um, in their natural habitat, brought them into the, the academy, and actually spawned and successfully reared larger banty seahorses um, for, for, for their public aquarium. So, but no, we don't see those. Awesome. 
Yeah, just to give you guys a little heads up too, if anybody's new to the stream or just joining us, um, we're taking questions. Uh, probably for the next, let's see, we got, probably for the next about five, 10 minutes. We wanna get a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, what's going on in our facility too. We've got some really great new fish that Kevin wants to show um, that we're working on. And uh, yeah, we definitely wanna get out to that. Um, so I think we'll take a few more questions still. Um, let's see. Well, Eric says, uh, it's not really a question, but it's just what he did to get rid of the ick. He went fishless for 80 days to get rid of ick uh, slash velvet. That's the only way to put the remaining fish in QT. You bet. So when you pull those fish out, um, into a separate quarantine system, and you, know, you need to leave your your reef aquarium fallow or fishless, you know, for for at least 60 days, um, so that, that that life cycle of those parasites, whether it's with Amblyodinium or Cryptocarion, will will die off, um, and then when you reintroduce your fish back, um, you, you should be in a, in a much better position. But it, everybody has dealt with with parasites in, in reef aquariums. And I can't stress enough the importance of actually quarantining fish, regardless of where you purchase them from, regardless if you purchase them from your next door neighbor and he's had them for you know five years, this fish. Always any new fish that you bring into your home, any new animal you bring into your home, you want to quarantine them in a separate aquarium prior to, to putting them in your display tank. And the main reason that you want to quarantine the animals is so that you can become familiar with um, their behavior, you can observe their behavior, you can ensure that they're eating prepared foods prior to, to having them try to compete against the fish that are already in your display. Um, and most importantly, you can, you can mitigate the risk of passing pathogens to, um, to your established reef aquarium. So quarantine everything that you bring into your home. Um, it'll definitely help reduce the likelihood of, of disease transmission um, to your established fish. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Thank you for the question. Alex asks, can you tell us QT methods for fish and what you would recommend for home aquariums? That's a great question. So I would start by trying to establish some form of biological media um, in your established reef aquarium. So we'll take this aquarium behind me, my 120. I've got a nice sump underneath it. What I would do is I would take some really nice big sponge filters and I would, I would put them in a sump where there's good water flow and let them develop and, and, and establish themselves with nitrifying bacteria so that you can utilize those sponges or that, or that media that you're establishing, say for, for six weeks or eight weeks, you can utilize that media on a quarantine aquarium that you could set up. So depending on the size fish that you're, you're, you're bringing into your display, um, you know, things as small as a, a small 20 gallon conventional glass aquarium with a, with a good heater, you know, a, a good, good lid, you don't want a lot of evaporation so you can maintain the proper specific gravity in the aquarium. So good heater, good lid, um, and utilizing a good, good sponge filters or utilizing an, an established media in a conventional power filter that, that hangs on, you know, the back of the aquarium. Um, it could be as simple, again, as a conventional 20 gallon glass aquarium. If you've got a really large reef tank and you're bringing in things like surgeon fish or, or larger angel fish, Obviously, your quarantine tank needs to be a little bit larger than a 20 gallon. So, you know, size the aquarium, your QT tank, based on on the the animals that you're going to bring in for your display. But again, start with established media, move that media to a to a quarantine tank where you're going to bring your new animal into, um, and then you know let let them go through at least a, a four to six week quarantine period again, so that the fish is accustomed to you. He's eating prepared foods. You can observe the behavior and ensure that you're not going to transmit disease to your existing uh, existing fishes. Uh, Robin asks, how, do you, how often do you recommend changing out the charcoal filters? How often for water changes? So from, from a carbon, the, the GAC, granulated activated carbon, you know, I would suggest changing carbon in your aquarium um, about every three weeks. Um, that, that's, it depends on the type of carbon that you're actually utilizing. Um, some, some carbon um, is, is much better than others. So, you know, we sell a, a, a private label carbon um, under the Drs. Foster and Smith brand. It's a, it's a pelletized carbon. We also sell a granulated carbon. That's what I actually use on the, on the reef aquarium behind me, um, this 120 or 180 gallon split tank. Um, and I change the, the media in those reactors every three weeks, so. Water changes, that's uh, personal preference. I, I'm under the 
my strategy is I like to do very frequent water changes in very small quantities. And the reason I like to do that is to try to maintain the proper balance of minerals in the aquarium and not stress the animals from massive water changes, um, you know, say once a month. So if you can em employ that strategy to, to change a small quantity, like 10% on a weekly basis, that would be ideal. If you can't do that, maybe try 20% every two weeks. And, and that's, in my personal opinion, the, the, the way to go. Great, thank you for the question. Um, another one from Eric, uh, he wants to know what new salt. What new salt, okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this. I'm gonna show you the bucket this time. So this is uh, the Live Aquarium Professional Reef Salt. Um, this salt is going to be available on September 28th. Um, we've been working really, really hard over over the months and, and, and the year to develop uh, a new salt that we utilize here in our aquaculture coral facility here in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. So um, this is called the Live Aquarium Professional Reef Salt. Uh, we use this salt here again. Um, and, the, and the best thing about the new Live Aquarium Professional Reef Salt is it's, it's made in very small batches. So it's made in about 2,000 pound batches um, with, with the highest quality raw materials so that you know there's very consistent um, parameters between, between the uh, batches that are being made three sizes. So here, here's a box. This is, uh, this is a 180 gallon mix box or two sorry, 205 box. gallon yeah. mix box um, We actually use these boxes right here on the coral farm um, There's it's the most cost-effective for us um, Again, this is a, a small batch mix salt. It's got the highest quality raw materials uh, It mixes up really really quickly and it mixes up very clean as well. So it's it's really helping us create a much more stable environment for the animals that we, that we maintain and grow in our facility here. Um, and for me, as an avid reef keeper, you know, I, I keep this my SPS coral aquarium behind me at about 90 kH alkalinity. We we maintain the coral farm, um, the corals that we grow on the coral farm at 90 kH. So um, that's that's where this salt comes into play in that it mixes up at, at a a little bit lower alkalinity than a lot of other salts out in the marketplace. So, you know, a high calcium level, high magnesium level, um, stable alkalinity at around nine, um, and the proper ratios of strontium and potassium in, in the salt mix as well. So, again, this is available now for pre order on drsfostersmith.com and it's going to be uh, ready to be shipped uh, on September 28th. Uh, great. Uh, yeah, and if you have any questions, you know, about the salt or if you want to check it out again, yeah, check out drsfosterandsmith.com. Um, we got a great introductory offer on the smallest size. It's a 53-gallon mix bag. Uh, so if you're looking to try it or if you want to start something new, it's on a smaller, um, smaller amount of water, uh, it's a great offer. It retails at $24.99, but we're giving away a $25 gift certificate for a short time with the purchase of the 53-gallon 53, 53 mix bag. So it's a really great offer. Uh, head over to doctorsfosterandsmith.com and you can pick yours up if you're interested. Um, Michael asks, what are the best angelfish for a mixed reef tank? It's a very controversial topic. So throughout the years, nobody can keep angelfish in reef aquariums. Well, you, you can. The right, the right species, depending on what you're trying to maintain um, or what you do maintain in your reef aquarium. So, most angelfish are very specific in what they, they try to pick at or, or what they like to eat. Um, the most common angelfish that are kept in reef aquariums um, would be uh, centropygy angelfish or the, the, the dwarf angelfish. Um, some species are a little bit easier to keep in reef aquariums than others. Um, and then again, some of these angelfish will target specific types of coral. So it seems that most centropygy angelfish like to target sessile corals that sit on the bottom of your, your, your reef aquarium that have large fleshy polyps with no tentacles. So things like trachophilia brain corals, scalemia corals, uh, acanthastria corals, those corals seem to be the primary target for centropygy angelfish when you're trying to keep those in reef aquariums. So normally uh, things like mushroom corals or things like soft corals, um, even, even some SPS corals, um, it can work out. You can keep angelfish in, in with those corals, but just understand if you know all fish are individual, so it, it's not uncommon that you might 
you know, try to put, say, a flame angelfish in, in your SPS coral aquarium, and he takes a liking to a certain strain of acro that you're growing. So you just got to be, be prepared to be able to remove that fish out of the tank um, or remove those corals out of the tank that that, that fish is taking a liking to. So um, to add to that, if, if you grow a lot of coral frags, um, I would try to stay away from, you know, from angelfish and reef aquariums. If you have big, well-established colonies like what's behind me here, that's that's a little bit different story. You know, larger colonies can take getting you know picked at infrequently, infrequently, um, and and still thrive in, in your reef tank. So, a coral frag that's a you know one-inch coral frag or you know some frags these days are, are you know a couple you know a couple polyps. Um, if an angelfish takes a liking to those, it'll probably destroy that coral within a day. So, you know, just be careful. Of what species and and you know what kind of corals that you're keeping. So, great. Well, I think that's all the questions we're going to take for the live stream. Um, of course, if you have any other questions, feel free to. We're going to try to get back to them. Um, um, you know, as after the live stream and everything like that, we'll definitely want to get to you guys' questions. Um, so, you know, if you have any questions, don't don't be free to keep asking them. What we'd like to do now is take you guys into the facility, and then take a little tour and actually show you some of the um, some of the cool fish we got in. So let's go do that. So I'll show you some right. of the, the three rafts that, that I was talking about earlier. Okay. Turn you guys around here. All right. Okay. So welcome to our Coral Farm and Aquatic Life facility. So we were talking about earlier um, how we quarantine fish when we first bring fish into our facility. We're walking towards our, our 4,000 gallon quarantine system for marine fish. And I'll take you by some, some really neat stuff at first. Say hi, Shasta. <laughs> so in this tank right here, um, we've got uh, what's called Anapsis Leonardi. And there are these tiny rats oh, there yeah. in the corner. Um, they're super, super cute. They're little juveniles. Um, these guys come from Western Australia. Um, what we're feeding them right now is a, is a mix of, of Nutrimar ova. Uh, Nutrimar ova is basically uh, crustacean eggs. Um, we're also feeding them from some cyclops, um, which is a kind of a, a micro food. And you can see these fish are, are super healthy. Um, they're definitely creating a hierarchy in the display, kind of chasing each other and, and sorting things out. There's also a really small captive bred scribbled angelfish. That that's uh, we're, we're really proud to offer these captive bred angelfish from Bali Aqua Rich um, in Asia. He's he loves the camera there and he's swimming <laughs> right up front. So that little cute guy is is uh, again a scribbled angelfish uh, spawned and reared by a Bali Aqua Rich um, in Asia, and that fish will be offered for sale here soon in the divers den section. So. Let me show you a couple more fish. Um, this guy right here is my favorite fish. So anybody that knows me knows I love um, the, the blue striped tamarind wrasse or Anapsis femininus. So this Anapsis femininus uh, is a female. Um, Anapsis wrasse are dichromatic, meaning that the, the males are different color than the females. Um, this female is a bit bright yellow with electric blue stripes, um, you know, bright orangey yellow in the front. It's pretty interesting as this fish would transition into a male since they are hermaphroditic, um, if the fish were to transition into a male, um, it would have these dark bright blue stripes in its face um, on, a, on a bright banana yellow body. Awesome. Moving down here, um, another really cool fish that unfortunately just swam behind the yeah. door there. He's yeah. actually in the tube now. Yeah. Um, oh. it, this fish is gonna be in the diver's den today. Um, or one, this species will be in the diver's den uh, today. We've got a couple of these fish here in the building. Uh, okay. This is called Paracylenus pisilineatus. This is the Mauritius flasher wrasse. So it's the, the, the holy grail of flasher wrasse. Um, yes, these fish are incredibly expensive, but just a beautiful, beautiful fish um, that, that we're gonna have available here on liveaquaria.com in the diver's den. So to kind of wrap things up, uh, another awesome fish that we spoke about earlier today are, are right here in this oh, tank. Yeah. And those are called uh, Choate's Red Leopard Grass. So it's Macrofringodon chodi. Uh, these fish are from Australia. 
and you know we've been conditioning this batch up here now for about a week and a half um, and these guys um, they are super healthy you can see they're they're out and about um, they're really taking prepared foods really really well um, and within a few weeks we'll hopefully have these offered in the divers den store on livecorea.com So that about wraps it up. Yeah. I, I want to thank everybody for, for your engagement today. I want to thank everybody for, for asking questions during our live feed. Um, keep asking questions on the feed. Uh, I'll try to get these answered. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank all right. you. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you later.